Okay, our second uh, speaker is Julius from King's College, London, and uh, his talk is about box recreation for boundary interoperability. Please, Julius. Yeah, thank you. Okay, uh, thank you. I would first, I would like to start off by thanking the organizers for giving me this opportunity to present my work. I will be talking about uh, three recent works, one, one, one which we did with uh, David Grabner and Nikolai Gromov uh, last year, and two more papers which will hopefully be out by the end of the year. Um, okay, so let me get right to it. I will start directly with the setup. So the main object of my consideration will be the Maldesena Wilson loop in n equals four supersymmetric Yang-Mills theory. And the Maldesena Wilson loop uh, is, uh, so it's, no, it's a Wilson loop, but you also have an additional coupling to the scalars. And as you see in this picture, we have a Wilson loop, uh, we have a Maldesena Wilson line here, and we include a uh, coupling to the scalar phi one. So one of the real scalars of the theory in this Wilson ray, and we have another Wilson ray here uh, where we include uh, a coupling to the scalar phi one cos theta plus phi two sine theta. Now this setup uh, in per, so this uh, here, and also we have in, introduced, so these two Wilson rays, they meet at a point at a cusp uh, parameterized by cusp angle phi, but also because I've introduced, I have two different scalar couplings on the two rays. I also have an internal cusp angle theta. Additionally, I can make some scalar insertions at the cusp, but these scalars, so I, I insert L scalars Z, and these scalars are what I would call orthogonal insertions or insertions of scalars which are orthogonal to the ones that uh, couple to the line. This general setup on its own diverges and uh, it diverges in the following way, uh, where this is the IR cutoff, this is the UV cutoff, and, uh, and, uh, and delta represents the scaling dimension uh, in the case where we have z to the power l, where l is equal to zero, then we have the cusp anomalous dimension. And if we have l non-zero, then we have the, the overall scaling dimension. Now, okay, you can ask me, why do you want to study cusps? Uh, the answer to the question is the following. So if we have an infinite straight Wilson line, we can always perform a conformal transformation and map it to a circle. In a similar way, we can also map a cusp Wilson line to a lens. And it was, uh, and in a and in a similar way also, if we have, um, if we have like a Wilson loop with circular edges meeting at n cusps, it has been shown by various authors uh, to various degrees that the uh, the expectation value of such uh, an operator, uh, such an observable, behaves uh, like the endpoint function of uh, local operators. So this is an interesting reason why uh, this is the reason why cusps are interesting. In particular, I will be uh, at, I will be in in what's known as the ladder's limit. The ladder's limit is obtained when you take that Tuft coupling G to zero and analytically continue the angle theta to I infinity uh, in a particular way, so that a particular combination of them is kept uh, fixed. Uh, in this limit, what ends up happening is again in the case I have no orthogonal insertions, only ladder diagrams con contribute, uh, uh, only ladder Feynman diagrams contribute. But in the case where I do have scalar insertions, then now I have uh, what are known as fishnet diagrams. So once I have all of this set up, uh, let me bring, uh, let me start discussing the main thing. The main object of my discussion is what I'm going to call the CFT wave function psi. Now this CFT wave function is what you, you can think about it as the lens shaped uh, Wilson loop, which I had a couple of slides ago, but I take the second, uh, I take the second point and I point split it. In particular, what this means is that I have finite Wilson line going from T to zero and zero uh, and uh, zero to S. I have L insertions at the cusp and I have external insertions of, uh, of Z bar at different points Y1 till YL. Now, in particular, if you look at the Feynman diagrams of, uh, of this uh, CFT wave function, they have an iterative structure yeah, and we can label them by bridges. So we have here, for example, a, a diagram with four bridges. But the interesting part is that I can define what's called a graph destroying operator, which I can act on the CFT wave function and it will reproduce for me the same CFT wave function, but with one bridge less. Now, why we want to do this is if we, so this is how the graph de destroying operator uh, uh, acts. And so why this becomes interesting is because if we take the, so alpha here is the number of bridges. If we take the number of bridges alpha to infinity, then it turns out that our CFT wave, wave function psi actually behaves like the ground state 
uh, of a Hamiltonian of an open spin chain of particles, which we call the open, uh, the open fish chain. Now, at first look, this Hamiltonian in 4D looks really in, like it's got like an, it looks super non-local because you have a product of kinetic terms, but uh, it's not, not that bad because what we can do is embed it in 6D. And if we embed it in 6D, basically, if I have a cusp Wilson line with, uh, with uh, L insertions of Z, this corresponds to uh, uh, a fish chain with L, uh, L particles in the bulk and two boundary particles. The only thing is that the boundary particles are fixed uh, to live on the light cone in six dimensions while the bulk particles have four degrees of freedom. And this is uh, rather useful for us and it's very non-trivial actually, but what we can do uh, now is use the so-called method of images uh, I mean, okay, so the, 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 the fact that the boundary particles are fixed on, um, are fixed on the light cone uh, can be implemented by introducing actually a set of mirror particles, uh, which, are, which are the mirrors of the particles that we have in the bulk. And this entire, now, uh, this entire double chain, you can say, can be closed finally. And actually it is a multi-particle classically integrable system. And what's more, uh, integrability even uh, carries on to the quantum level. We can associate with each of these uh, particles in the bulk, a lax, uh, an L, a lax operator, and in, with each of these boundary particles, a, a, a reflection operator. And we can actually uh, see that the boundary Yang-Baxter equation, here I show it for L is equal to zero, uh, is satisfied, but it doesn't matter. I can have as many, uh, L operators here as I want, which would correspond to making insertions and still by usual and Baxter, uh, the, the transfer matrix that I construct will commute with itself for different values of the spectral parameter. So that's great. Uh, what we can also do is construct uh, non-trivial uh, representations of the auxiliary space because we want to construct all the integrals of motion for the system that we're dealing with. And turns out that all these integrals of motion sit in these polynomials here. And if you do the, if you actually, if you count the number of conserved charges, you actually see that uh, we can construct four L plus two conserved charges in total, which ex equates exactly to the number of degrees of freedom of our system. So it, this, uh, this system is integrable uh, at the quantum level. This, so the back, so yeah, once you have the T uh, functions, you plug them into the TQ relation and then you massage it a bit and you get the Baxter equation. So let me show you results. It's non-trivial to uh, solve this Baxter equation uh, even numerically. Nevertheless, and I won't explain exactly how we do it here, but nevertheless, we get the following, uh, uh, we get the following solutions for L is equal to one. Now looking at these solutions, uh, you might be a bit confused and say, uh, hey, Julius, uh, you said L was equal to one, so you should get only one state, but why do I see infinitely many excited states? And I tell you actually ask uh, Kolya and Andrea and Fyodor, because they correctly interpreted these excited states as corresponding uh, to, so to say, parallel insertions, which mean uh, insertions of scalars, insertions of scalars which are spanned by those that couple to the Wilson line itself. And this is actually quite cool because what we can do is we can then take the straight line limit of the cusp and obtain the defect CFT that lives on the uh, that lives on the half BPS Maldacena Wilson line and also have access to its spectrum. And that's uh, exactly what we did as well. So we, we considered uh, the straight line limit where we have this defect CFT. And uh, in particular, I just want to consider scalars that, so uh, the, I, I just want to consider uh, scale operators which uh, transform in the singlet of the SO5R. Uh, this correspond to zero orthogonal insertions, but I can have any number of J parallel insertions uh, so by parallel insertions, I mean insertions of this guy. And so for, uh, and yeah, so, and so these are our results uh, for the case of L is equal to one. So I have a Wilson line and I just insert over here a parallel, uh, a, a parallel scalar. So the same scalar that uh, couples to the Wilson line. And I see that at weak coupling, I have just one singlet at strong coupling. I have another singlet. These two have different uh, engineering dimensions, but the numerical solution of the quantum spectral curve neatly interpolates between both of them, which is really, really cool. Uh, again, we have a really or high, high order result at weak coupling. We have up to five loops, four order result at strong coupling. And also recently I've been able to generalize this uh, for any J. So with no orthogonal insertions and any number of parallel insertions I can produce for you all of the states. 
and uh, which is which is nice. So I'll just leave this quick summary over here. We have shown that the Feynman diagrams of the CFT wave functions in the classical limit are correctly uh, resummed by discretized open string, which is integrable both in the classical and quantum level. Um, we have actually de derived the adiacency correspondence for these observables. And okay, I don't have any more time, but thank you. Yeah, thank you, Julius. Let's unmute our cell phone. Questions, please? I don't have any questions. <laughs> okay, maybe I can uh, start. So uh, that um, uh, graph destroying cooperator, is, is it true to say that it is kind of discrete step in beta salpeter equation for this cusp? Uh, the honest answer is I don't know, but I think I think we I think yes. Because uh, that's actually what I wanted to. I mean, to remove one uh, one uh, one bridge. red line. I don't know is yeah. it what you mean. Then yeah yeah beta salpeter it's uh, yeah it looks as one step in beta salpeter and the question actually was uh, do you know eigenfunction for this beta salpeter because it's non-trivial equation in this case yes you have uh, two partial derivatives on the left and you have integral operator on the right. So um, the question, do you know how to, to solve it? If you know. Sure, it's, it's, oh, okay, I shouldn't think of it. Mm -hmm. No, but to be honest. The differential I... equation. Mm -hmm. uh, well, in this case, uh, it will be a differential integral equation, right? But so Peter. So it is minus one step. The answer to your question is minus one step. So it's a differential. Yeah, but... yeah, but if you go in another direction, it's <laughs> it will be integration. Yeah, you have to go in the right direction. <laughs> Somehow it is a question. Does uh, going in this direction help you to write eigenfunction for another direction? <laughs> for better so Peter, if you know this, and uh, can how, you write? Mm -hmm. How how comes that uh, the graph building operator? Uh, has become graph destroying the operator. Tell me this. Because it's inverse. It's inverse. Of it. That's inverse. <laughs> why yeah, yeah, it's, it's why totally it's inverse. <laughs> ah, no, we, because uh, so if you expand this path ordered exponential, we needed a way to expand, to reduce the expansion of path ordered exponential by one step. And that we got by acting with this derivative along the along the Wilson line itself. So <laughs> this is what. So the main point is one is integral, which is a bit uh, naughty, and another is differential operator, which we uh, like. So in a sense, the problem is similar to this problem of finding uh, conformal blocks uh, before, right? So you have some insane differential operator and it is it embeds into integrability that's true that's true is it is it somehow related your computation to uh, bus bus dixon type integrals it's superficially it seems uh, sort of similar but uh, well uh, does it contain i mean does one contain another or not so, I mean, the CFT wave function is quite a general object. So I think you can definitely use it and glue different CFT wave functions no, together. That, to... that of course, but I mean, uh, Bus and Dixon managed to compute uh, very concretely, uh, some concrete uh, uh, quantities. Like uh, here, uh, if- well, After Dixon, you have four points and scalars are fixed. Here they integrate yeah, along the lines. So mm -hmm. maybe it's in some, Dualization meaning uh, if you take it light cone or something, it will uh, go to to the integral. I don't know. You have to dualize something, right? Mm -hmm. It's like uh, all is you can make a square, but uh, scalar will run along uh, the uh, the edges. It won't be attached to uh, along the sides. No, it won't be attached to the. Uh, that be, maybe obtained by various uh, limits. Okay, I'm not sure it's, <laughs> it's a reasonable question. Uh, can you calculate uh, the whole two point function, not to just dimension, but like in just when you have only letter, you can resum all letters and calculate two point function, yes? Yes. So, yeah, can you do such thing? Well, but uh, I mean, the two point, the non, the non trivial information, the two point function is the dimension, right? Is the scaling dimension. No, no, it's also normalization, yes. Uh, 
Well, normalization is scheme dependent. Yeah. When you calculated a free, free cusp correlation function, you normalized on two point cusp functions, yes? Yes. Then the question, so what... uh, you, you need to calculate two points. So in that case, you had only ordinary letters. Now you have more complicated stuff. So can you make this step here? Hmm. Okay, it's for discussion. Yes. <laughs> And um, yeah, now we go to the last speaker. Okay. Um, let me just. Where is the clock? There. One sec, one sec. It's not your clock yet. Mm. Okay. 